I invite you now to take your Bible and turn with me, please, to 1 Samuel chapter 16. 1 Samuel chapter 16, we begin at verse 14. But the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. And Saul's servants said unto him, Behold now, an evil spirit from God troubleth thee. Let our Lord now command thy servants, which are before thee, to seek out a man who is a cunning player on an harp. And it shall come to pass, when the evil spirit from God is upon thee, that he shall play with his hand, and thou shalt be well. And Saul said unto his servants, Provide me now a man that can play well, and bring him to me. Then answered one of the servants and said, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, that is cunning in playing, and a mighty valiant man, and a man of war, and prudent in matters, and a comely person, and the Lord is with him. Wherefore Saul sent messengers unto Jesse and said, Send me David thy son, which is with the sheep. And Jesse took an ass laden with bread and a bottle of wine and a kid, and sent them by David his son unto Saul. And David came to Saul and stood before him, and he loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer. And Saul sent to Jesse, saying, Let David, I pray thee, stand before me, for he hath found favor in my sight. And it came to pass, when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul, that David took an harp and played with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. Let's bow together in prayer. Almighty God, as your people, we have been called to hear your voice. You have called us and taught us in your word to be diligent, to study your word, to show ourselves approved unto God. We pray that your spirit will come and undertake for us today as we both speak and hear, and we pray, gracious God, that you will open our eyes that we may behold wondrous things out of thy law, things that will transform us, and things that will bring us into a closer walk with Jesus Christ, who loved us and gave himself for us, and calls us to be his witnesses to the ends of the earth. We pray in his name, amen. The story is told of a minister who felt sorry for an elderly man when he saw him almost every morning on his daily walk through the park. Given the man's physical appearance, it seemed to the minister that he had had a rather difficult life. And so one morning, the minister handed him an envelope containing a $10 bill with a little note that read simply, never despair. The next morning, the elderly man was the one to approach the minister, and this time he handed him an envelope containing $60. The minister was surprised and asked, what's this all about? And the elderly man replied, never despair was in the money, paying six to one in the second race at the Downs. Well, Job said, man is born unto trouble as the sparks fly upward. We hardly know anyone who hasn't experienced some degree of trouble in their lives. It may be something that resulted beyond their control, or it may be because of personal choices that that person has made. We know that in Saul's case, what caused the trouble was Saul's disobedience. The Bible tells us plainly, the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul because of that disobedience. And an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. 
Now that's hard for some of us to wrap our minds around. After all, we're accustomed to associating an evil spirit with the devil, not with God. But in this case, we could easily draw the wrong conclusion unless we back up and consider the context. Think back. King Saul began his reign as the first king of Israel after he was anointed with oil, myrrh, and special spices by Samuel at the Lord's direction. Now that anointing was a religious observance. It was an act of making the king God's representative to the people. And it was always performed either by a priest or a prophet. Saul was 30 years old when he was anointed king and he reigned for 42 years. That's a pretty substantial amount of time. And for the personal demands of his calling, Saul was endowed with a special gift beyond his own natural abilities, beyond his own intellect, beyond his own skill. When the Spirit of the Lord came upon him with power at that anointing, he began to prophesy. And his friends remarked, is Saul also among the prophets? So this was a special event. That special gift that Saul received was God's Spirit, through whom Saul would have all of the virtue, all of the energy, all of the discernment, as well as all the charisma and guidance needed as he would in the role of monarch. In the Old Testament, though, we read that the Spirit of God came upon men and women for a specific purpose or a task, and then it departed, such as Samson, you will recall, wiping out the Philistines. Now that gift of that spirit was comforting for Saul, I'm sure, because up until now, Israel had never had a monarchy, never had a king or a queen. There was no prototype for Saul to follow. So it was important for him to be in fellowship with that spirit of God constantly. As long as Saul maintained an open and responsive attitude to the Spirit of God, he never wanted for power to subdue Israel's enemies or to order his kingdom aright. But by one decision after another, eventually Saul proved that he was in rebellion against the Spirit of God until finally it came to this gargantuan defection, which tipped the scales, as it were, away from God's spirit remaining with him. When the Lord made a decision to settle accounts with the nation of Amalek for having opposed Israel when it first came out of Egypt, God made it crystal clear what Saul's orders were. The Amalekites were a band of guerrilla terrorists who lived by attacking other nations and confiscating their property and their people, their families, every bit as detestable as human trafficking now going on anywhere in the world today. <clears throat> as I said, they were the first to make life miserable for the Israelites as they were departing Egypt and heading out for Canaan Furthermore, we know that the Malachites attacked Israel when Israel disobediently intended to take the promised land after their unbelief and whining at Kadesh Barnea. Furthermore, those same Amalekites continue to harass Israel with raids and pillaging every chance they get. In other words, they made life quite miserable for the Israelites. God knew that his people would never be able to live in peaceful coexistence with the Amalekites, nor would they ever be free from the contaminating influences of the Amalekites' idolatry. And consequently, the only way for God's people to maintain a pure relationship with him and to experience the full measure 
of his blessing and peace in the promised land was plain and simple, to wipe the Amalekites completely off the map. That's what it would take. See, here's a nugget of gold for victory in the Christian life. We should never bother asking God to give us relief from the periodic raids of the flesh over our lives. Lust, greed, complaining, gossip, laziness, none of those. The only way to put a stop to trouble like that is to do what Galatians 5.24 instructs us to do. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with its affections and lusts. In other words, the solution is not self-control. It's much more radical than that. The solution is crucifixion. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, or the life I now live in the body, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. But he said, I'm crucified with Christ. In other words, everything was under the ban. Saul was commanded to spare nothing and no one. There were to be no souvenirs taken home after the battle. There were to be no spoils of war. It was meant to be destroyed. And that was the only way that God could ensure the well-being and spiritual prosperity of his true people. See, we're so used to pampering sin in our society today that we don't even recognize the need for this wholesale cleaning. Talk about social distancing and hygiene. Ha! We've been sleeping with the devil so long in America that there's been more attention paid to reopening bars, nightclubs, tattoo parlors, and nail salons than asking about when churches will reopen. And apparently nobody raises any objection to the inconsistency. But wherever we gloss over sin in order to protect what we already have, or for that matter, in the interest of getting something we don't have but want, we aren't being shrewd, we're being lewd. We're blatantly disobeying God Almighty and there are consequences for such disobedience. At the battle of the Amalekites, Saul mobilized 200,000 troops plus 10,000 more from Judah. They attacked and God gave them a stunning victory over Amalek. King Agag was captured. King Agag, along with some of the best of the sheep, cattle, fat calves and lambs, were spared, along with whatever else apparently looked good to Saul and his men. When asked about it, he replied that they thought that was apparently the thing to do, so that they would have sacrifices to offer to God. But Samuel came to him and challenged him and said, what meaneth the bleeding of the sheep in my ears if you obeyed God? Then he reminded him, the Lord wants obedience rather than sacrifice. That's what he delights in. Now that simple act of disobedience was this, apparently the straw that broke the camel's back. And after that, it was all downhill for Saul. Someone, not just sure who it exactly was, once remarked, too bad Noah didn't swat those two mosquitoes. Well, that's a good point. Some small things often create big problems. Some years ago, actually it was July 19th, 1989, the fifth deadliest crash involving a DC-10 in this country occurred out in one of the cornfields in Sioux City, Iowa. In the crash landing with 296 passengers on board, 112 of those passengers died in the crash. Another 184 passengers survived. When the National Transportation Safety Board investigated, 
they found that the probable cause of that accident was inadequate consideration given to human factors and limitations in the inspection and quality control procedures used by United Airlines engine overhaul facility. It seems that there was a fatigue crack in the titanium alloy stage one fan disc rotor that began the size of a grain of sand that went undetected by ultrasound. Now it's always tempting, you see, to rationalize our troubles by blaming someone else or something else, but the truth of the matter is one small oversight is tantamount to a disaster. Is there any sin in your life that you've written off as too small, too insignificant to sweat the details? If so, be careful. Because the Bible says a little leaven leavens the whole lump. A small overlooked moral lapse in our lives has a way of bringing down our whole Christian testimony so that it crashes to the ground. In Matthew 12, Jesus said, But I say to you that for every idle word men shall speak, they will give account of it on the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Notice Jesus never said, well, you'll have to answer for that book you wrote that misled so many people and was not truthful. No, no. It's not necessary to write a book. Jesus said, all you have to do is speak an idle word. And he said, every idle word that has been misspoken, we will need to give an account of on the day of judgment. So when we ask, what's the trouble? Suffice it to say that for Saul, it was disobedience. And in that, Saul is not alone. Someone said the best way to straighten out your youngsters is to bend them over your knee. Oh, but we are too civilized in a country, in, a, in this America. We're too civilized to do such a thing. Well, then we're too civilized to obey God's word because Proverbs 22:15 says, foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction will drive it far from him. However, the spiritual impact of having God's spirit withdrawn from Saul was only the beginning of his trouble. Saul now entered another phase of trouble that quite frankly is even scarier. We note that the human spirit does not allow for a vacuum. So the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. Now when we deliberately grieve the Holy Spirit of God, we open the door for another spirit, which is the antithesis of God's spirit, you say. What came over Saul exactly, we don't know. But we do know that it left him tormented on the inside in much the same way that the man in Gadara that Jesus met living among the tombs, it was much the same. You remember him, the fellow that terrorized the neighborhood with fear, that mutilated himself, that broke chains that were intended to subdue him. It was certainly something like that. It was something more than depression. But for now, the royal staff, Saul's servants, had a suggestion for the king. Music calms the savage beast. Let's get someone in here to play some nice, beautiful music. And whenever this evil spirit comes upon you, O king, that person can play the music and help you relax and calm down. Well, the search for someone so skilled turned up a little young shepherd boy who apparently had lots of practice playing on the lonely hillsides at night 
as he took care of his sheep. And the question arises, why in the world wasn't anyone fit to assume this job among the palace musicians? I mean, come on, there must have been someone among them who could perform this function on behalf of their king. But David was chosen, evidently over any of the palace musicians because he played the harp to a different tune. David's playing was in concert with God's spirit. It was delightful and it brought temporary soothing relief to Saul's distemper. And I believe that God added to David's skill something of his own grace for David's sake, perhaps not for Saul's. His playing put Saul in a better frame of mind temporarily, but it really didn't strike at the root cause, you see. For Saul, the problem was deeper than depression. It was more like insanity. Later, he would try to pin David to the dining room wall with a spear on more than one occasion. Ultimately, it wasn't David's harp or music that Saul needed. It was David's God whom Saul had spurned. Music is good. Work is good, hobbies are good, recreation is good, but none of it can ever be used to cover over a troubled conscience that cries out to be restored to fellowship with God. Not for any of us. The only thing that will work in a case like that is confession of our sin followed by repentance and asking for God's forgiveness. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. But whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Now, nevertheless, this was a providential arrangement, you understand, that David had been elected musician for the king's therapeutic music treatments. It was not actually Saul's benefit, but for David's benefit. Saul's need, it turned out, would present the perfect opportunity for this shepherd boy, who, by the way, unbeknown to Saul, had already been anointed king, to come inside, as it were, the government and to gain firsthand knowledge of the inner workings of leading the nation, being the king, what it was like, including what not to do. And the whole point of this passage is the beginning transfer of the kingdom of Israel after 42 years with Saul to now David. So to summarize, the trouble of disobedience is often followed by the trouble of torment. But oddly, some trouble can be the sign of something good about to happen. Now think of it. While David was walking humbly with the Lord, yet the trouble for him was in a sense just beginning. And here's what I mean by that. Since he was just a teenager at the time of all of this, he had been anointed by Samuel as the next king of Israel to succeed Saul. And that meant he would yet face Goliath, he would yet be banished by King Saul, he would yet hide in the desert and live as a fugitive, he would be forced out of the nation, he would have to fight many battles in order to maintain the Lord's calling on his life. It would not be easy. In all, it was nearly 15 years between the time that David was first anointed king by Saul until he actually became king and was confirmed as king. And most of that time, he experienced trouble with a capital T. He was tempted, he was tested, he was tried. And just like Joseph back in the time of Egypt, so God would use this time to convert him from being a shepherd boy into a king. Come to find out 
This is the way God works in the lives of all. His children. That is his children who walk in step with the spirit. The Bible says that we're called not only to receive the spirit, but to walk in the spirit. Now it's counterintuitive, but trouble is opportunity in work clothes. Many years ago, there was a man by the name of Georgie Vins. He was another person who made the best out of life's worst. Georgie Vins was a pastor in the Soviet Union at a Baptist church. And in 1979, he was arrested for resisting government controls. Then he was exiled in 1979 to the US because of his Christian faith. But before this, Georgie Vins had spent eight years sleeping on a grimy concrete floor next to an open toilet and living on barley extract, tea and soup in a Soviet prison. And while locked down deep in the bowels of a Siberian compound, Vins wrote a diary and he entitled it Testament from prison. What is so remarkable though about this diary is that it does not even mention once the hostile prison conditions. It doesn't mention what cruelty he may have experienced. It doesn't mention his deprivation. It doesn't mention the misery that he suffered. Those kinds of things usually pervade most of the writings smuggled out of the Soviet Union labor camps in that period of history. Instead, what Georgie Vin's book described was this, the beauty of the Siberian winters, the joy of receiving letters from his wife, his love for his native Russia, and his intimate conversations with God. Now, except for its title, you see, that book written could have been written by a free man living in a penthouse overlooking the Black Sea or by a Christian travel agent. But no, it was written by a man from a prison. And the question is this, if you and I want God's blessing in our life, we must have it on his terms, not our own. And that means that we must not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom we are sealed unto the day of redemption. And if we want God to use us, we should not expect a bed of roses. And if we want the Holy Spirit to guide our lives, then we should not try to dictate to God the travel plan. You see, a life without any trouble is a life without any real muscle or any fruit. And no one knew that better than our precious Lord, Jesus Christ. We know that he was a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. Certainly if anyone knew what trouble was, Jesus did. And yet he went to the cross for you and for me. He died in my place and in your place. And when he departed this world, he said, but wait, wait until you are endued with power from on high. Wait till the Holy Spirit comes and you will receive power to be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. May I ask you this morning, 
Do you have that Holy Spirit? Today, when God gives his spirit, he gives it permanently for us to live in victory, to, for us to live with confidence, for us to have his spirit bear witness with our spirit, that we are the children of God. And if children of God, we are heirs with God and joint heirs with Christ. What a power, what a conviction to carry us forward and to give us strength to face any challenge, any opposition, any uncertainty, and to know beyond the shadow of a doubt that we are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ who loves us.